Good morning. And can I welcome you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this, our first of our online services here at Calvary Kirluk. It's the 22nd of March 2020 and we're very much in the midst of this COVID-19 outbreak. It's, uh, it's very strange to be sitting here talking to a camera instead of talking to the congregation that I know and I love. But we'll get past this, guys. This is only temporary. So put your trust in the Lord and, and do the right thing. And the Lord will bless you in it. This form of this service is going to take this short introduction by me and a reading from God's Word and, and prayer requests that we need to put forward. And then possibly there'll be a couple of worship songs Maybe not in video form, but in, in audio form. And then after that, there will be a teaching, which will be an audio file. It won't be a video file. So as we start this morning, can I welcome you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for tuning in to listen to this. It's only one way that we can keep in touch. And so I urge you to keep in touch with your brothers and sisters in Christ and see where any need some help. Doreen and I are doing well at the moment. Although we're classed as one of the vulnerable group, uh, it doesn't feel that way. But we thank you for your prayers and your concerns for us anyway. So I welcome you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. And, and let's open this morning by reading from the book of Psalms as we work through the Psalms. And I'm going to be reading from Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labour in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children are a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. Amen. If you would just like to quiet your hearts now, join me in a, a short time of prayer. I've made up a little list here. There'll be no surnames mentioned in this because it's a broadcast, but you'll know who we're talking about when you listen. Father, we just thank you and praise you that you are king over all things. We bring this whole situation with this COVID-19 virus before you, Father. And we ask that you would bless your people, Lord, watch over them and keep them that this pestilence would pass quickly, Father, and people would get back to their normal lives. There will be many, Lord, who are despairing this morning, many who are struggling with the thought that this might bring death. But to us, Lord, you, are our, you have overcome death. You are eternal life, and we put our trust in you, Lord. Help us to take the sensible precautions that we're asked to take, Lord, but at the end of the day, to put our trust in you. And so, Lord, as we remember these things, we remember those who are sick or less fortunate than ourselves. And I pray for Diane's dad this morning. Pray for Brian and for Kirsty, for Tom and Bill and Patricia and Marlene and Donna. Pray for Margaret's husband, Robert. Pray for Anne's sister, May. Pray for Robin and Kathy and for Colin and for Jacqueline, for Rosie and Caitlin for Derek and for Mary and their children, for me and Fiona and Stuart. We remember the bereaved to you as well, Lord, and ask your blessing upon them. We pray for Rose and for Malcolm, and we remember the persecuted church to you, Lord, and pray for them, especially, Lord, as they'll be suffering not only from the virus but from the lack of food supplies. And I pray, Lord, that as we go shopping this week, Lord, that will not be greedy people, that will look out for others, Father. And in that, Lord, we'll be able to bring that blessing to these people. When people ask us, what is this COVID virus all about, Lord? This, we can say to them, this is about putting your trust in Jesus. And we thank you for that this morning. So be with us and bless us, Lord, as we, as we continue the service with a little bit of music, I hope, and then with a, with a study, a 
at the end and as I say to you this will be an audio study so don't be looking for a picture you'll hear my voice but you won't see my face that's so that I can record these things in my pyjamas and stuff like that you know so anyway anyway we give you thanks and thank you for all that you do for each other and keep your heads lifted towards the Lord it's easy to become despondent but we're not a despondent people we're an encouraged people so I just thank you for listening to this broadcast this morning and I'll see you again next week. God bless you all. Amen. Okay, this song is called Hallelujah for the Cross. Up to the hill of Calvary, my Savior went courageously, and there he bled and died for me, hallelujah for the cross. And on that day the world was changed, a final perfect lamb was slain, that earth and heaven now proclaim, hallelujah for the My dead to grief for deeds to pay, but God, my Savior, made a way. Hallelujah for the cross. A slave to sin, my life was bound, but all my chains fell to the ground. When Jesus' blood came flowing down, Hallelujah for the cross. This hope will guide me into death. Hallelujah for Only the holy ocean
Bibles to book of Matthew easy to find first book in the New Testament but as most of you know being the Bible students that you are there are four Gospels that start off the New Testament Matthew, Mark, Luke and John the first three are classed as what are termed as synoptic Gospels synoptic is just a Greek word sino is a word that means together or, or part of and optic 
you can guess means to see. So you've got to see these things together. The first three, Matthew, Mark and Luke, are three Gospels that in some measure intertwine, interfold with one another and, and should be seen together. John is different. John's Gospel is different in that John, John's whole mission from God was to prove that Jesus Christ was divine. And uh, we've looked at that many times. One of my favourite books. There's a before we actually start in, in Matthew, there, there's a prophetic end of it that we have to look at to see where these gospels came from and that they were indeed God inspired. Because at the end of the day, we've got to accept that all Scripture is God inspired and is there for our teaching and our admonition and our learning. One of the prophetic views of the Gospels in the Old Testament in Ezekiel chapter 1, and I'll just read it to you, but you can note it if you want to read it later. Ezekiel was the prophet who was sent to the, to the diaspora of the Jews who were taken into captivity in Babylon uh, during the time of King Nebuchadnezzar of, of Babylon. And Ezekiel was sent to tell them, you know, don't, don't bother about thinking about going back to Jerusalem at this point in time because the word of the Lord has come through Jeremiah that you're going to be here 70 years so settle yourselves you're not going back for a while and one day when Ezekiel was beside the river he looked and this is Ezekiel chapter 1 from verse 4 I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light the centre of the fire looked like glowing metal and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance their form was human but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being, and on the right side of each had the face of a lion, and on the left face an ox, and each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. They each had two wings spreading out upward, each wing touching, the, touching that of the creature on either side, and each had two other wings covering its body. So we see there we've got four living creatures around the throne of God. This was Ezekiel's vision of the Lord. And uh, there were four, there was, the, 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 there was a face of a man, there was a face of an eagle, there was a face of an ox, and, and, and uh, there was a face of the, what, what was the other one I said? A lion, sorry, I couldn't miss a lion. And in Numbers 2 and 3 as well, we see the tribes of Israel encamped around the tabernacle. And when you look at how the camps were set out, you had a camp, they were very organised. They were very organised in the way they set out the camp. And the, set, the camp had to be set out in a specific fashion. And we find that, you know, Balaam, who was, the, who was hired by, by, by uh, Balak to pronounce a curse upon Israel, when he looked down from the top of the mountain, he probably saw the camp spread out like this, in the shape of a cross, And as you look there, you can see that in the eastern end here, down at the bottom, we've got the camp of Judah. And their standard was the lion. In the south and the left there, we've got the camp of Reuben. And their standard was the figure of a man. And in the north side, we've got the camp of Dan, whose emblem was the eagle. And in the west side, we've got the camp of Ephraim, whose emblem was the calf or a young oxen would be a, a, a better translation of it. The numbers that are in there are the numbers of the people that were numbered amongst the, the children of Israel and the different tribes. The tabernacle was in the middle and the four camps spread out from it. If it's not prophetic to you, it certainly was prophetic to me when I looked at it because these are, this is a scale drawing of the numbers just taken as lengths and breadths and if you look at them, of course, you see the shape of the cross. And what's in the middle of the cross is the tabernacle. And the tabernacle, of course, represents Jesus Christ. So the whole layout of the camp represented a, a prefiguration of Christ on the cross and his sacrifice. That's fine, Anna. 
So they were very organised. When Balaam stood up there on the top of the mountain to look down in the camp of Israel, he saw that crucifix shape and he saw it and he couldn't, he couldn't curse them. He had to bless them. And when you see that, we've got Judah in the east as the lion. That's their banner. Now, the door into the tabernacle or the entrance into the tabernacle was in the east. And of course, prophetically, if you wanted to go into the tabernacle, you had to pass through Judah, the camp of Judah. And Jesus was the lion of Judah. To enter into the presence of the Lord, you have to pass through Jesus Christ. You have to pass through that line of Judah. And in the north, we had the eagle. In the west, we had the young ox or the calf. Reuben, we had the south-facing uh, camp, which was the, the configuration of a man. And so we look here and we see that in this, when we're going to do study Matthew, we're going to look at Matthew. He was directed his, his gospel towards the Jews. He was very much the one who would tell the Jews who Jesus was. We'll find that very often he uses son of David to describe Jesus, which would not be lost in the Jews. That was They were expecting a Messiah to come from the line of David. And of course, if we look at Matthew, their emblem is the lion, the lion of Judah. Just the same as it was in Ezekiel, just the same as it was in Numbers. We'll look at Mark. Mark's gospel predicts Jesus or shows Jesus as the servant king. And that's the young ox. The young ox was always considered to be the servant, the servile animal in amongst the, the people of that time. So the young ox or, or the, the calf would be, the, would be the, the servant king. And Luke, Luke's gospel, as we've studied before, always looked at Jesus as being the man, the manly side of Jesus, the human side of Jesus, the way that he, he, he had problems even with thirst and starvation and all the rest of these things that, that afflict us as human beings. And of course... The banner for Luke was the man. And John shows us the divine side of Jesus. And he's had the banner over his gospel as the eagle. So there we have the sort of prophetic end of what happens there. Now, of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, only one was written by a disciple really. Matthew, or Levi as he was known, he was called to the ministry in chapter 9 of Matthew. And we'll get to that as we, as we get along here. But the, the thing about Matthew is that he was a tax collector. We know he was a tax collector because he, he admits that himself and the, the gospel explains that to us. He was probably wealthy and he was probably quite thuggish in his behaviour. Matthew, being a tax collector, would be someone who wouldn't be able to walk down the street without having bodyguards around him. He was hated by the, Roman, uh, by the Jewish people because he was in cahoots with the Romans. Now the Jewish tax system or the Roman tax system at the time, you bought your, you bought your, uh, your commission from Rome. So I, I would go and put a bid in for a million denarii and I'll take Judea and Samaria. And they would be give that to me and I would hand a million denarii over to, to Rome and then I had to get that money back. So I would employ all these sub-tax collectors and they would all collect taxes on my behalf and eventually I would probably be paid maybe four or five times what I'd actually paid for the commission to collect taxes in the area. But the tax collectors themselves, people like Zacchaeus as we know and, and Levi, Matthew as we know here, they were very adept at, at, uh, at charging extra. Uh, and their behaviour and sometimes was really quite thuggish. They would force people to pay taxes over and beyond what was asked of them so that they could make a big profit. So this was the type of man that Jesus called to the ministry. This thug, this wealthy thug who took no conscience at all about taking his people to task and beating people up because they wouldn't pay their taxes properly. But the one thing about tax collectors was that they were organised. They had to be organised. And they had to be literate. They had to be able to write. They had to be able to keep a book and make sure that they kept it correctly because their whole livelihood depended on, upon being able to do their sums and keep their book about who paid what tax to whom. The other thing they also had to be was fluent in Greek. And so Matthew would have been fluent in Greek because that was the language of the day. After the Romans took over the Greek Empire, 
Greek persisted and Greek habits and Greek culture persisted and they were still using Greek as an everyday language here the Romans would be anyway Aramaic would be used as well but in the main transaction details Greek would be the one that was used and Matthew's gospel was actually written in Greek it wasn't written in Aramaic and it wasn't written in Hebrew he wrote it in Greek because he was he was he was fluent in Greek he was literate in Greek and Greek was a language that was spoken all over the Roman world at that time so if Matthew had written this gospel basically a letter or a short book a pamphlet if he'd written that and sent it away in Aramaic or some other language people would be saying well what is this how do we read this so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit Matthew wrote it in Greek Jesus knew well these traits that Matthew had that he was literate in Greek that he was a stickler for detail that he wanted to do everything by the book on the nail, on the button and so we find ourselves in the year 50 AD about 17 years after Jesus has been crucified and risen from the dead a few years before remember when we did the study in Romans it was about 52 or 53 AD when Paul wrote the letter to the Romans from Corinth well this would be a few years just before that Matthew collected his notes and his thoughts together because it's almost impossible to imagine that Matthew being the the stickler for detail being the, 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 the guy that wrote everything down that he would take many notes on his time with Jesus he would put them all down he would keep his logs he would keep his journals and now some 17 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ Matthew collects all his notes and his thoughts together and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit he started to write his book his testimony as to who Jesus Christ was amongst the disciples apparently according to early sort of church tradition that Matthew was known as the note taker or the minute secretary any time they had a kind of meeting Matthew was the guy that took the notes took the minutes any time that Jesus was doing sort of even an informal teaching with them or whatever Matthew was the guy that wrote the things down so what does he start with here in Matthew he starts with a genealogy and he starts with a genealogy because that's what Jews do they're very big into genealogies all the gospels have a genealogy except Mark now you might look at Matthew and see it's obvious there's a genealogy in there you might look at Luke and see that there's a genealogy in there you might look at John and say well John doesn't have a genealogy but it does the first few verses of John are the genealogy in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and he was with God in the beginning that's his genealogy he was the son of God it doesn't get any longer than that we don't need any in-betweens there was God and Jesus and that was it so there's a genealogy Mark has no genealogy because Mark presents Jesus as the servant king servants and slaves don't have genealogies they're just articles to be used and put aside whenever we choose to do so the Jews are great genealogists there's no question or doubt about that it was one of the major reasons why so many of the Nazi war crime war criminals were caught was because people could produce their genealogies and, and identify people who they were and, and, and who had done what to who etc so it, it's, it's something that's lived with the Jews for all of those years and here we are right at the start we'll just read through this genealogy and then we'll talk about it a little bit Matthew 1 verse 1 this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah the son of David the son of Abraham so right away Matthew puts his nail on this this is the genealogy of Jesus Hamashiach the Messiah the Jewish Messiah the son of David the son of Abraham so anything that the Jews wanted to know about Jesus is contained in that very first opening statement and then he goes on to push it further and he starts at Abraham and he says Abraham was the father of Isaac 
Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amananadab, uh, Amananadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now, I'm going to stop there. You can read all the rest of that for yourself. But we're down as far as David here. And this is where the, the, the line changes, the, uh, things change. In Matthew, we see here what is referred to as the legal line or the royal line of Joseph. It's a situation where the whole genealogy comes down through Solomon, who was the oldest son of David from his, from his uh, illicit uh, affair with Uriah's wife. Now, I believe that this Uriah's wife was written in there quite deliberately because Uriah was not a Jew, he was a Hittite. And uh, so indeed was Bathsheba, who was Uriah's wife. So well, when you look at Luke's Gospel, you'll see an entirely different way of doing things because in Luke's Gospel, we've got a situation where it doesn't come down through Solomon, it comes down through his other surviving son who was Nathan. Now, right away, He's, he says at verse 17 when he finishes off this uh, genealogy he says thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David 14 from David to the exile to Babylon and 14 from the exile to the Messiah now we believe that Matthew has put these into 14s because it's easy to remember 14, 14 and 14 and uh, there, were, there were actually more generations in there but the Jews have this fancy habit of just compacting things if they, if, they, if they think it's irrelevant or they want to hide it a wee bit they'll just close it up because they can say that I mean I, I, I'll say this Jesus was the son of David no he wasn't he but if you add all the generations that are in between them you can make a case for it but to say that you know Jesus was the son of David or as Jesus himself said to Zacchaeus after he had sort of made his proclamation of faith he said this too is a son of Abraham well he wasn't actually a son of Abraham but he was in the sense that he could check his descent to Abraham but he wasn't an actual physical son so the generations can be mixed up a bit here but he's proven here that Jesus is the son of God and it was a big issue for the Jews that, that the son of David it had to be somebody who was of David's line that was going to be the Messiah now the wonderful thing about what Matthew has written down here is that nobody has ever actually contradicted it. Although there have been many people who have refused to accept Jesus for various reasons, nobody has ever said that he was never the son of David. Now, it's unusual in this genealogy, <coughs> in fact, highly unusual, because there's four women included in it. Five if you count Jesus' mother Mary. In verse 3, we have Tamar, who was, who was mentioned there in the genealogy. Now, Tamar was the, the daughter-in-law of Judah, who was the brother of all the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, he had, he had three sons. Judah had three sons, Er, Onan, and Shelah. And Tamar was given to Er. And Er apparently was so wicked in the eyes of the Lord that the Lord put him to death and Tamar was left without a husband and left without a, a child either. So Judah at the end of the day gave Tamar to Onan under the Levirate law. Do you Bible students remember it? That if a son marries a woman and he dies and the woman has to pass on to the next brother so that they can have an heir, etc. So Onan also died and Tamar was left without a husband again and without a child and Judah promised her that when Shelah who was too young at the time when he grew up if she went back to her father's house and lived as a widow when Shelah grew up he would promise to bring them together <coughs> and that would be her husband her covering but Judah didn't do it Judah, Judah double crossed her and so Tamar took revenge on him she dressed herself up as a prostitute at the side of the road and uh, she enticed and seduced Judah and she had two children by, by Judah. Now, 
I want you to think about this because these are the people that, that Jesus has descended from. You know, this is this is like who do you think you are? You know, um, it would surprise you who's in your family at times. And then, of course, we've got in verse five, we've got Rahab, who was the mother of Boaz, who we always think has been a great a great uh, character in the Bible, Boaz. But Rahab was his mother, and she was a prostitute in Jericho, and. Her life was turned around. She was, you, you could say she was born again when she heard the, 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 what the Lord was doing through the two spies who had come into Jericho and she promised to look after them and she let them out down the window and God spared her life, etc. And of course in verse 5 also we've got Ruth who was a Gentile. She wasn't even a Jew. And neither was Rahab. Ruth was a Gentile bride of Boaz. And then of course at verse 6 we've got Bathsheba. The adulteress who, who spoiled herself with David, King David. She was Uriah the Hittite's wife and of course we all know the story. Those of you who are familiar with it will see that you know, David it actually says in 1 Kings, I think or 2 Kings, that while all the armies of the king were out fighting their battles, David was in Jerusalem. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He should have been out with his armies and he was in the wrong place. And of course he ended up in a, an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and he ended up murdering Uriah the Hittite to, to, so that he would die and that he could marry his wife. But what I want to point out to you here is that this genealogy is no different for ours. This is just a family. Dysfunctional, yeah, but a family just the same. But it shows us that Jesus is not just a Messiah to the Jews. He's a Messiah to everybody. And not just a nice people. There's three prostitutes in here and a few murderers. And this is in the royal line. This is the, this is the, the, this is the way that God inspired Matthew to write his genealogy. Now, if God's promises are true, and we believe that they are, there is no way that Joseph could be the biological father of Jesus. The legal father, yes, but the biological father, no. And why do we come to that? Because, again I said, not everybody was included in this list that Matthew put down. But at verse 11, we've got a thing there that Josiah and Jeconiah were father and son, or it would appear to be that. But that's not really the case. Josiah was the grandfather to Jeconiah, verse 11. Jehoiakim was in between. He was the father of Jeconiah. And herein lies the problem. Let me read you from Jeremiah 36, at verse 30. Therefore this is what the Lord says to Jehoiakim, king of Judah. He will have no one to sit on the throne of David. His body will be thrown out and exposed to the heat by day and the frost by night. I will punish him and his children and his attendants for their wickedness. I will bring on them and those living in Jerusalem and the people of Judah every disaster I pronounced against them because they have not listened. So Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to the scribe Baruch, son of Neri. And as Jeremiah dictated, Baruch wrote, on it all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and many similar words were added to them. So, Jehoiakim, he was the, he was a real bad guy. He was a, he was a king in Judah just before the, uh, the, the captivity in Babylon. In fact, he was probably the last king. I think they changed his name as Zedekiah. And he was taken captive into uh, Babylon. And because of the bad things that he'd done, he'd, he'd instituted all sorts of Babylonian worship and that to try and appease uh, Nebuchadnezzar, to try and say, well, we're, we're like you guys, we, we worship all these daft idols and we sacrifice our children in the fire. And because of that, God basically said to him, you will have no one on ever on the throne of David. No one from your line will ever be on the throne of David again. And in some measure we could say that that's a blood curse. That was God's promise to them. So when we see this coming down to Joseph, there's no way that Joseph could be the biological father of Jesus, as many claim he is. That Joseph and Mary had a wee bit of hanky-panky before they get married and, and they passed it off as being something other than, than, than a, a miracle from God. 
If God is true to his word, then there's no way that Joseph was the biological father because, G- because God had cursed that line that nobody out of that line and nobody from that line was ever the king again in Judah. There was no king in Judah. There were many princes like Zerubbabel who took the people back into, from Babylon into Jerusalem but there were no actual kings on that line. Jeremiah had given Jehoiakim a written prophecy from the Lord concerning what he was supposed to do with, the, with Nebuchadnezzar. And basically what God was telling Jeremiah to tell Jehoiakim was surrender. Give it up. Step back. You're only going to produce problems for yourself. Surrender to Nebuchadnezzar because I've sent Nebuchadnezzar to punish you. So don't stand against it. Otherwise it will only go for worse. And of course Jehoiakim wouldn't listen and he took the scroll that Jeremiah had written for him and he burned it in the fire. And of course that was, that was the ultimate uh, that was the ultimate insult to God that you would take the word of God and burn it in the fire and God cursed him for it and said never again will a king come for your line uh, he will have no one to sit on the throne of David so Joseph at this point in time is left in a situation where his wife is pregnant this is how the birth of Jesus at verse 18 the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph but before they came together she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph her husband was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now Matthew does nothing for us here to explain this awesome mystery. Most of it we'll find in Luke. Luke was a great stickler for detail as well Matthew sort of takes it as read that, that this was a pregnancy through the Holy Spirit Matthew tells us not who the father was but how it came about and why it came about and it's told in some measure through Joseph's eyes Matthew writes it down as if it was Joseph that were telling the story there were three steps to marriage in Jewish uh, tradition. One was the engagement, one was the betrothal, and one was the actual consummate marriage. Engagement could happen any time, and it was a time when you were sort of informally a couple, informally an item. And then usually about a year before you were actually married came the betrothal. Now the betrothal was actually part of the marriage. Once you were betrothed, you were treated as man and wife. And the only way that you could part from that was to be divorced. Even although you had never consummated the marriage, there would be no marriage bed at this point in time. Betrothal, from the time that you were betrothed right through to the time you were married, if you had to separate, you had to be divorced. So betrothal usually lasted about a year, and there had to be no sexual relationship within that year. To find that Mary had been visited by an angel and had been told that she would become pregnant through, through the, the ministration of the Holy Spirit. And she accepted it quite readily. Whatever the Lord has for me, so it be done to me. I mean, it's quite remarkable the strengthening that the Lord has to do in people's lives to get them to walk in the way that he would have them walk. And it's the same with us. We need to allow that strengthening the Lord, not, not to walk into situations and say, well, I can't do this. You can. You can do anything through Christ Jesus who strengthened you. Right at this point in time, Mary was strengthened by it because this was a terrible situation. I mean, even today there's still, I suppose, maybe not as much, but there's still stigma about young women who become pregnant out of marriage. There's maybe no the same stigma that there should be. Neither is there maybe the same discipline that there should be in the life. But anyway, at that time it was absolutely taboo. I mean, Mary would be a complete outcast for society. Who would believe her? I mean, who would believe her if she came up with that story? I mean, you're saying, well, who was it? Who was it? Who the guy that done it? It was a ghost that done it. Eh? You get pregnant by a ghost? What a way to start a story. I mean, I don't even know whether Mary would actually tell anybody. She would just accept her lot that this is what had to be. She would say that this is what God required of me. 
But the people around the place would want her stoned. That was why in some measure Joseph, who obviously loved her dearly, decided, well, I'll try and put her away quietly, as quietly as I can. I mean, you still had to have papers signed and witnesses and all the rest of it, even at this betrothal stage. So it would not be totally quiet. And it would be a total scandal. I mean, an outcast for your family, an outcast for society. I mean, just... I mean, there's no words to describe how dreadful the situation was for Mary. And how... Irrespective of how reluctant Joseph was to get out of it. But after he had considered this at verse 20, Joseph that is, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus or Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. The way that's worded, and the way that the whole thing had taken place, it would almost appear that Mary had never actually told Joseph what she knew. This was a revelation to him in a dream. Take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And it was such a vivid dream. She will give birth to a son and you give his name Yeshua because he will save his people from their sins. The salvation of God, basically Yeshua. You know, there are many people today who won't accept the virgin birth. It's the start of a rocky road. We either have to accept these things by faith because nothing's impossible to God. That's what he told Mary when, when the angel appeared to him. How will this be, she said. And the angel said to her, there's nothing impossible with God, Mary. We, I mean, we, we have no idea how it's to be done, but God will do it in a very dignified and purposeful manner to accomplish his will. And the thing that really struck me in some measure was I was reading through this text, this commentary text in Matthew, now this was written by William Bartley who was a great Church of Scotland teacher and it in some measure it doesn't surprise me where the Church of Scotland has ended up today when I read passages like this let me just read you what he's written in this this is about this conception by the Holy Spirit. This passage tells us how Jesus was born by the action of the Holy Spirit. It tells us what we call the virgin birth. This is a doctrine which presents us with many difficulties. And our church does not compel us to accept it in the literal and the physical sense. This is one of the doctrines on which the church says that we have full liberty to come to our own conclusion. We either accept these things by faith or we don't. It's a bit like the prophecy about, you know, the blood curse on, on Jehoiakim. If we, we either accept that that's the truth and that God would not allow Joseph to have a, an illegitimate relationship with Mary or we go down the road to Professor Bartley. And in some measure that's where the church has stepped out of its role. It's making its own interpretation and allowing people to make their own interpretation of what the word of God says. So here we have here a situation where after Joseph had considered this, this was an angel of the Lord, not the angel, not the angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord. Every time you see an angel of the Lord, it's one probably one of the archangels like Gabriel or, or whatever. When you see it saying the angel of the Lord specific then that is a, 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 an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. That's a, a physical manifestation of, of the Lord himself. Joseph was not comfortable with his decision. He didn't want to put Mary away, but he was left with no option in the matter. The virgin birth is an amazing work of God. We don't understand it. I don't understand it. But I have to accept it by faith that that's what God did. And then, of course, the other churches that we have here, the Roman Catholic Church, are preaching this perpetual virginity for Mary. And, and this is no right either, because we know full well that the Bible tells us that she had many children after she had given birth to Jesus. And uh, if you can 
actually tie that up, square the circle with the fact that you can have maybe five or six, seven children naturally and still be a perpetual virgin, I'm sure the doctors would love to speak to you. So it is, you know, we're finding here that even in the early church, there were detractors from it. And even today, we've got detractors from it. We have to be clear that we stand in the Word of God because this is the written Word of God which becomes alive in us through Jesus Christ. We either accept it or we don't accept it. If you can't accept it, what else are you going to tear out? What other books are you going to miss out? If you say, well, I don't want that bit, and I don't want that bit, and I don't want that bit, you'll end up with nothing. It just becomes a book instead of the inspired Word of God. As I say, the context here is that Joseph didn't really realise that Mary was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. But this vision, this dream that God gave him was so strong that he couldn't resist it. All this, it says at verse 22, took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You'll find that Matthew will quote many, many times Old Testament prophecies. He will quote this fulfillment because this is what he wanted to prove. This is what his genealogy, his book wanted to prove, that Jesus was the fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies. In fact, the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecies. But he could only obviously include a few of them in here. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. That's Isaiah 7 and 14 if you want to look it up. Again, we find a situation, a clash between the intellectual side and the spiritual side. And the word that's used, Alma, in the Hebrew in the Old Testament can either mean a virgin or a young woman. And many detractors from the virgin birth will say, well, Isaiah didn't mean a virgin, he just meant a young woman. But here, here, the Greek translation here, that, that when Matthew wrote it, he used the Greek word parthenos, parthenos, sorry, which means a virgin, not a young woman. And anywhere else that you find that word, Alma, used in the Old Testament, it never describes a young woman. It always describes a virgin. So, although they're playing pedantics, semantics with the words the truth is that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel and the word literally means God with us or God present with us and in us verse 24 when Joseph woke up he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and he took Mary home as his wife but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And Matthew makes a big point of that. It's, it's almost in italics that did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. So the fact that Matthew's saying here that Joseph did not consummate their marriage until they gave birth to a son. And lawyers speak that as well. He did consummate the marriage at some point afterwards. So the, the object of perpetual virginity is, is null and void. It just doesn't operate. So we find here that Jesus, the salvation of God, a common name at the time. Josephus in his history of the time mentions at least 12 prominent people who were called Yeshua. But this was going to be the name above all names. You don't find many people within westernized Christian countries called Jesus. We'll call a few people Joshua. We'll use the name Joshua. But we never, use, we never seem to use the name, the Greek name Jesus. And yet, in some measure, it's a name above all names. I mean, if you wanted to be called after your hero, what a better name to pick than the name that is above all names. The name from which would come a salvation, not just for the Jewish people, but for us. Without it, we wouldn't be sitting here this morning. Without it, we would be a people still lost in our sins. Jesus came, and when we look at the genealogy there, we see that even the inclusion of women makes a difference because Judaism today still doesn't include women in their genealogies. Certainly Islam doesn't. Christianity does. Jesus includes everybody. All those who would confess their sin and accept the forgiveness of God through the blood of Jesus can be brought into that holy nation, that royal priesthood. 
to which we are privileged to be part of. And so here we are. The start of Matthew, the first chapter, we'll set the scene. And now we're going to go on and see what the life of Jesus was like through the eyes of Matthew, who wanted to proclaim to the Jews that this was their Messiah, their Hamashiach, Jesus of Nazareth. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you today for your word, Lord. We thank you that the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, Lord, has brought Matthew to write this, Lord. And even down through the ages, Lord, we can still read this as if it's fresh on the paper, Lord. Matthew would be astounded that I would be standing here this morning preaching about this out of an electronic tablet when he had to use a, a piece of parchment and a pen, Lord, in a very painstaking uh, exercise. But we thank you for it this morning, Lord. We thank you for that salvation which is open to us all, Lord. As you've proved through this genealogy, Lord, this first chapter, there is nobody excluded. Nobody. It doesn't matter what we've done, Lord, or where we've been. You can offer us forgiveness for sins, and all we have to do is accept it. Lord, we thank you for that this morning. Be with us and bless us and keep us as we go from here in Jesus' name. Amen.